Revelation chapter number 9. I will remind you where we ended last week. The first four trumpets have been sounded in heaven. We saw the impact that that had. The first four did. Verse number 13 of chapter number 8 said, And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels which are yet to sound. As bad as the first four were, and angels flying from around glory crying to the earth, Woe, not once, three times. Many times Jesus would say, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Which verily means intently, means sincerely. But he wanted you to know that he doubly on purpose said it to you. Verily, verily, I say unto thee. God really wanted you to hear it. So what happens when God sends a messenger and he cries three times, Whoa. I've heard people say he says woe three times one for each of the three trumpets that are left to sound I believe that any one of the three because of what happens after it it may be deserving of three woes all on its own but we know that what's about ready to happen is far worse than what we've already seen in fact I dare say that what we're about ready to see I know that no man has ever seen it before and I know that it's what Satan has desired for a long time. In verse or in chapter number 9, verse number 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. That's called hell. Right? The Old Testament, they thought hell was the grave. No. Hell is a place of torment, Jesus taught us. That there was a literal rich man who had a literal man named Lazarus that sat outside his gate begging for bread. And the rich man, when he died, opened his eyes in hell being in torment. Right? It's called here the bottomless pit. We know that it's filled with outer darkness. Not a bit of light to be found. We know that it's a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth where the worm died not where people are trying to inflict pain upon themselves to disguise or mask the pain from being tormented in that flame as the rich man said and on this day the door to that place is going to be open now you say how brother Jordan I don't know I know it's got a lock and God gave an angel a key and the angel came streaming out of heaven like a star on fire. And when he crashes into the earth, he undoes the lock and the bottomless pit finds a top. Doesn't say he opened up the bottom of it. It's still a bottomless pit. But he takes the roof off of it. Verse number two, and he opened the bottomless pit and there arose smoke out of the pit. Makes sense. I was always told where there's smoke, there's fire. Hell is a place of fire. The hottest fire that man can imagine outside of the lake of fire, which is so hot that it consumes hell itself. But the smoke rose out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. How much smoke's going to billow up out of hell? It's going to block out the sun. It's going to bring nighttime. It didn't say that it made it dim. It says it was dark. You know what darkness is? The opposite of light. It didn't say that it made things dim. It didn't say that the sun was dimmed by the smoke that came out. I mean, we got clouds, but yet the sun still shines. It's not dark during the day when clouds come out. Even if they're big thunder clouds, there's still light during the daytime. But here it says that it was darkened. Keep in mind, a third of the sun and moon and all the stars have already been darkened by God in the last chapter. 
But now we're talking total darkness. Because of that smoke. And the smoke, as it's billowing out, it covers the atmosphere of all the earth. Something comes out of the smoke. Now, I know that you guys have heard of smoke screen, especially if, like me, you watch James Bond movies growing up. That, that all magical thing that if you pull that, everybody just disappears. Well, there's a problem with that. You can follow the smoke trail and figure out where James Bond went. Okay, it's not as nifty as they, Hollywood wanted you to believe. But smoke is often used as a screen. In warfare, many a times, people that were besieging a city or attacking a city would light fires in fields so that the smoke would conceal the movement of their troops from the enemy. It's a well-known, well-documented battle tactic. For way back in the day before they had satellites and drones and binoculars and everything else, when all you had was your eyes, smoke was a good way to hide something. Well, here this smoke, verse number 3, there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. Now what are these locusts? There's something you've never seen before. I believe that the Apostle John is using best what he can to describe what he's seeing. But these locusts are a, either a creation of or a product of hell itself. I believe that just as when sin entered into this world, God's creations became corrupted by sin. I firmly believe that roses didn't have thorns before sin. I firmly believe that animals didn't devour others before sin. I believe there wasn't such a thing as face wrinkles before sin. I, I believe that before it was used as a symbol to represent to us what God had foretold, I believe that serpents used to be nice to look at. The Bible says this is the most subtle creature or beast of the entire garden. It was beautiful to look at until what? Until God changed it as a symbol to remind us that he bruised the heel of man, but God would send one that would bruise the head of the serpent. I believe that sin changes things. I don't know what these locusts started out as, but I know that Satan and sin have had their way with these locusts. I believe that they're flying. I believe that they may resemble insects. That's why he called them locusts. But locust everywhere in your Bible usually are a representation of destruction. If a swarm of locusts comes into town, they're eating all the crops. If locusts invade, if God, just as God did with the Egyptians, if God sends locusts, they're taking all the food that's out in the field. You can't stop them. You may stop one, but the danger of a locust is not in the one, it's in the many. They swarm you, they overwhelm you. They move too quickly as a whole for you to stop and intervene with. You can't meet them halfway, all you can do is stand in the middle while they fly past you. Which I believe is a testament to the fact that John the Baptist was right with God because it said he was out in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. Where'd he get all them locusts? God gave it to him. Because you can't catch a locust. You can try. You ever try to catch that grasshopper that leaves you all awake in the middle of the night? And you go to find it and it's coming from a different direction? All of a sudden, well, locusts are the same way. Well, it says that these locusts that came out of the smoke, under them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. We'll get to that here in a second. But verse number 4, it says, And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Now here's the thing. Didn't we just read in the last chapter that when one of the horns was sounded that God caused fire to come down and burn all the grass? Now do you believe that your KJV is the word of God? Do you believe that God knows the difference between all being consumed and destroyed 
that there wouldn't be any in this chapter? Well, see, we see it as chapter 8, chapter 9. That's not how John the Revelator saw it. He's getting a glimpse of things as they're happening through time. He's just seeing little windows, picture frames of what God's showing him. It'd be like if you went to a movie and then you took one still and you had to describe what was going on in that still and then we jumped to the next section of the movie or we jumped back, we jumped forward. He's just describing to you what he's seeing in the moment. But don't think that the Bible's contradicting itself because it's not. I know that in chapter 8, when God sent fire, it said to destroy the third of the trees, it said all the grass. Y'all know that there's a place, I believe it's in Greenland, maybe in Canada, I can't remember. They're close to one another. But it's called the world's grain bank or seed bank. It is a place that they're preparing for World War III and nuclear warfare where they think that one day the world's going to be so irradiated that you're not going to be able to grow plants anymore. So they've dug so far down underneath of the ice and into the rock that they have developed a cold storage place where they have frozen seeds of every type of plant and vegetation that they can find on the earth. They have a frozen sample of those seeds so that after the radiated wasteland is over, they'll be able to grow food again. But it's not going to be radiation that does it. It's going to be fire from heaven. But eventually, I believe they're going to take something like that. Not to mention all the places around the world where nowadays they're growing things through hydroponics and everything else. They don't need dirt anymore. They just need a place where they can put up some fluorescent light bulbs and water the plants enough in a day and they can grow plants inside. But he's saying the Antichrist has a plan on how he's going to say that God didn't destroy their chances, that they could still grow grass, they could still grow fruit. There are things that they can use. Well, these locusts, they're not coming for the grass that they've replanted. How long passes between chapter 8 and chapter 9? I don't know. I know it's enough time for the grass to come back. There's some grass that can grow real quick. There's other grass that grows real slow. How's it going to happen? It's all going to happen according to God's timetable. But these locusts aren't coming for the grass, which speaks to the fact that these things have been corrupted. You know what locusts normally eat? Grass. Grain. They're looking for vegetation. But here, it was commanded unto them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. So that means that they have free reign to attack man except for the 144,000 of God's chosen people. We saw them numbered previously when one of those seals were broken. They've got free reign to go and attack and torment mankind. Does unto given or and to them in verse number five. To them it was given that they should not kill them. I said it was given unto them that they should be tormentors of mankind. Not killers. They bring excruciating torment. Nowadays we would call it cruel and unusual punishment. You know why that's against? or it's outlawed by your very constitution of the United States. Because even the people that deserve to be punished, they are still humans. They do deserve the decency of a quick death if that's what it is that they need to receive as reward for their deeds. Right? If you get caught stealing, we don't cut your hand off. Why? Because that's cruel and it's unusual. If you stole, you have to make it good and then put time in. There's just one problem. The devil doesn't play by man's rules. It says, 
verse number 5, but they should be tormented five months. And their torment was the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. Remember how it said that they were given, these locusts were given the power of scorpions? What is the power of a scorpion? It's venom. It's a toxin that they deliver through a sting in their tail. It's not the exact same thing, but it's very akin to a snake's venom. But he's saying, I'm saying that these locusts are a product of their father. Satan desires to bite the people of God and to bite mankind to do what? To poison them with a venom that'll take them to hell with him. What are these scorpions, or I mean these locusts, what are they given? They're given a power of a scorpion, which is a whole lot like a serpent. It testifies to the fact of who they serve. They're not here for the better. A scorpion only attacks to defend, usually, or to kill something that they've caught within their pincers, to eat it. It's either for hunting or it's for defense. Except here, they're not doing either. These locusts sting in order to cause torment. There are very few things in nature, even after sin corrupted it, that torment its prey. There are things like spiders that will put up a web. And what does the web do? It catches a prey until what? The spider gets hungry. The spider doesn't take it and torment it in the meantime. It leaves it in the web or it'll spin a more web around it so that it cannot get away. A snake that has venom, any of them that, you know, you've got enough common sense to be scared of. They tell me that the black mamba is the most potent venom. They say within about eight heartbeats you're dead because it's already coagulated your blood. They say that I think it was three drops of that venom will kill an elephant. It's potent. It's meant to do a job and to do it well. Right? You're not much better off if you get bit by a diamondback or a rattler here in the U.S. Some are more potent than other, but all of them have the same thing. It's to kill quick. Nature doesn't beat around the bush. If a tiger's hungry, it doesn't take the gazelle and then, you know, just keep scratching it to hear it bleat. No, it chokes it out. Why? Because it wants it dead so it can eat. That's what sin did to this world. Now, hallelujah, there's coming a time when Jesus comes that again there will be peace on the earth. The wolf and the lamb will be able to lay down together. Why? Because the turmoil and the conflict brought by sin will be gone. Hallelujah. But see, even what they're doing here, keep in mind I've told you, and we've said this, when the Holy Ghost is brought out of the earth, when the church is raptured out, this is Satan left to his own devices. Satan gets to do what he's always wanted to do. You know what that is? Torture mankind. Why? Because mankind was made just a little bit lower than the angels. But mankind had a choice. And God loved man before he made man. And because God showed love to man, man showed love to God. That's the Bible. Herein is love, not that we love him, but that he first loved us. We reciprocated that love out of choice. And because of that, God fellowshiped with man. You know what Lucifer's job was in heaven? He was full of instruments, the Bible tells us. He was the minister of music, if you will, in heaven. He was the one who set the stage. Doesn't the Bible say that God inhabits the praise of His people? Well, it was His job to lead the praise and in glory. And He saw that God delighted in the praise. 
Why? Because God's worthy. But no matter how good Lucifer played those instruments, no matter how great the praise was in glory, God chose to leave his throne and to come down to a garden that he made on earth and hang out with a fellow named Adam and his wife Eve. The Bible says that he walked with them in the cool of the day. Didn't matter how good Lucifer played, why he hated man. He hated that man was loved of God. And so what he tried to do, he tried to usurp the throne of God. He was cast out of heaven, and ever since then he's hated man. Especially after God told him, one day man's going to have the opportunity to become something that you never could be, a joint heir with Christ. So these locusts are the first time that Satan's had free reign to do what he wants with mankind. Except for the 144,000. I love that if God sets a hedge around his people, not even Satan can break it. He gave them a line and said, you can't touch these, you can't touch the grass, you can't touch the trees, any vegetation, but the rest of them, you can have them. And it says they'll be tormented for five months. Now there's no torment coming or like there is for what's coming with the lake of fire. We're going to read that the lake of fire is the second death. It's a place so hot that even death itself is consumed in it. That's torment in my mind. I remember I broke my foot. I think I was in the seventh grade. And we got to the hospital and the doctor asked me the wrong question. He said, imagine the worst pain that you can and on a scale of one to ten, I said one. He said, are you sure you were limping? And I'm like, well, the worst pain I can imagine is hell. This is nothing compared to hell. He didn't know what to say to that. He said, okay, let's take that out. It's the worst pain you've ever experienced. I'm like, oh, we're at about an eight. That's a different scale. But the worst pain you've ever been in, the worst pain that you've ever seen someone experience, where their body has rejected whatever treatment it is that's been offered. Or maybe it was a result of cancer where literally their body is fighting to destroy itself. Or the torment that you've seen on somebody's face is senile or has dementia or Alzheimer's and you can see the actual emotional pain on their face because they can't remember but they know that they recognize you. Bundle all that torment into one, multiply it by whatever you want to and it still doesn't compare to the torment that's being brought here. All that you have ever had to face in your life the Bible tells us we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers, spiritual rulers, spirits of wickedness in high places. There are things behind the scenes, but it's always been used, using things that you can see, you can touch, you can feel, to impact you. Just like God uses people to reach other people, Satan's been doing the same thing, because he always tried to imitate the way that God does things. But here, for the first time, there's no beating around the bush. There's no hiding the ball underneath of one of the shells and moving things around. The very roof to hell has been taken off. And out of this smoke that comes billowing out of the pit. Remember, it's complete darkness. Can't see which way it's coming from. Can't defend yourself from what you don't know is coming. The terror already of seeing the sky be blacked out with smoke from hell. And the end result is that if you stung, five months of unimaginable torture. I believe they're in such torture they won't even be able to feed themselves. But we'll get to that here in a little bit. 
it says verse number 6 and in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them God takes away death from the world I will remind you that Jesus rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. But it says that he has the key to what? Death and hell. When he got up out of the grave, he proved to Satan that he was God over all, even death, even hell itself. So what's God do? He locks up death. And Christ says for a time, there is no death. You can pray for it. You can cry for it. You can desire it. Which goes contrary to man's nature. The carnal self. We wear these things because we know one day we're going to run out of time. There are people eating grass juice and getting injections full of a whole bunch of stuff. Why? Because it's supposed to make them live longer. Make them be healthier. Man will go plumb broke trying to get one more day out of their life. But why doesn't a Christian do that? He, I've already got all eternity promised to me. I also know that God puts a number on man's head that man can't change it. You're going to live as long as God said you're going to live. Doesn't matter what the doctor says, doesn't matter what you believe, doesn't matter what you pray God to do. Unless God says that he's going to change it, it ain't changing. You can eat all the Fruit Loops, right? Little Debbie's, McDonald's that you want to. You may get fat like me, but it ain't going to kill you unless God says it's going to kill you. And you're not going to die of a heart attack unless God said that's the way you're supposed to go. Now, do I believe in tempting God? No. But God said that as long as you give praise and blessing and thanks for what God allows you to eat, that he'll bless it. Some people have forgotten that. They're trusting in the FDA to bless their food to make it healthy for them. I believe that you just got real thankful for what God gave you, that God bless it for you. Why? Because that's what he said he'd do. But, don't know how we got off on that, but you're welcome. To say they shall desire to die. No one wants to die, truly. The people that think that they want to die, those that commit suicide, they think that they want to die until they see what death is like. If they wake up in hell, they don't want to die anymore. The only problem is it's too late. People think that they want death until what? Till they see what death is. Keep in mind, the fourth horseman's already ridden by. He was the one that rode on a pale horse whose name was death, and hell followed with him. Death and hell have been walking all over the earth before this. And men so feared it that they ran to cave, they were crying for the rocks to kill them then, just at seeing the face of God. Now they're being tormented for five months every second of every day from the moment they get stung until that venom wears off. How long does it last? Five months, according to your Bible. And they're in such pain they beg for death to come, but death will not answer. It says, In the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Now again, he says... It kind of looked like a locust, but it doesn't look like a locust. It said the bodies or the shape, if you will, look like war horses. Keep in mind the time that John wrote this, war horses were a little bit different than what they used in World War I. Right? They were horses that were clad in armor and plate to defend against arrow and sword. Because the only thing besides your sword that was more valuable to you in combat than your own life was your horse. That was your mobility. That gave you a height advantage. That made it so that you 
had the upper hand on the enemy. If you lost your horse, you lost the advantage. So what are they clad in? Well, these beasts, I believe they've got many legs. Why? Because he called them like horses. I think they at least got four. But it says, horses prepared unto battle. So I believe it's like an insect, like a locust. Why? Because if you put a locust underneath of a microscope, you know what it looks like? It looks like they've got little armor plates stacked up on, on top of each other. It's called their exoskeleton. Your bones are on the inside, theirs are on the outside. Everything that protects them is on the outside, like armor. And I believe that these locusts, shaped like horses, prepared unto battle. What's it mean? They've got a lot of strong pieces on the outside to protect what's on the inside. Well, it says on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men. Those crowns, I believe that he says they were crowns like gold. But I believe that that crown is a symbol of where they come from. It says it was like gold, but it wasn't gold. But to do, it identifies them with the one that we're getting ready to read about here in a few verses. They've got a king, and their king has given unto them a position. It's a status symbol. They were appointed to do this unto men. And they proudly wear that title. But it says, these suckers, they don't have faces like ants and bugs and they don't get the little antennas and everything. No. These locusts, they have the face as of men. They've got two eyes, they've got a mouth, they've got a nose. Do they look human? Didn't say that. But they've got a face like a man. You're not afraid of what's on the front end of this thing. It's the tail that you're afraid of. But, it says, and they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. Again, hardy. Horse armor goes on the back of the horse, down the legs. Usually the chest is open, but this one says, nope, even their chest is covered. As it were, breastplate of iron. Everywhere you look on this sucker, it's got something to defend itself from you. But you've got nothing to defend yourself from it. It says, And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. I've mentioned a cricket before. Right? The sound of a cricket can be annoying. The sound of an airplane going overhead sounds like a roar. It's fleeting. It passes for a moment. But there's so many of these suckers that as they start flying up out of hell while they're still in the smoke, then they descend from the smoke down to earth. It sounds like a war party coming right to where you're headed. Keep in mind, the smoke's already darkened. Every direction that you turn and you face, it sounds like somebody's sending a whole army just for you. Everywhere you turn, there's no end to it. Doesn't say it's the sound of one horse running. That's loud enough. You ever heard a horse gallop through a field? Sounds like he's running on rocks, even if he's not running on rocks. Now imagine many of them in chariots, all bearing down on your position, right where you're standing, because that's where they're coming from. Or that's where they're coming to. They're coming to one person. Singly. To sting them. It says, and they had tails like under scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. It's not the fact that they have a tail that is the problem. It's that the tail's got a stinger. I wouldn't have a problem with honeybees if it wasn't for the fact that I've been stung a few times. I got a bigger problem with wasps. Those hurt more. 
And God forbid you get bit by an angry hornet. But see, those are stingers that don't necessarily have venom in it. Those are barbs. Right? That's a needle point that you get pricked with. But see, these suckers says, their tails like unto scorpions. What's that mean? A scorpion can use its tail to strike many places without moving. It can articulate that sucker to hit just where it wants. But it's not the tail that you need to be afraid of. The next ones that we're going to be talking about, maybe you can be afraid of that tail. But this tail, the tail is nothing special. He says, the thing that makes these tails specials is what God allowed to be put into them. Right? Isn't that just like the devil to take something that you think you understand and twist it to where it causes you pain and damage? He'll sell you a false bill of goods. God says, man, look at on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. Well, the devil's really trusting that you really look on the outward appearance because he's real good at disguising a whole bunch of evil in something that looks real nice he's the king of the carpetbaggers you all know what carpetbaggers are old timey term for somebody that would show up with a bag full of goods and they'd promise you all these things all you had to do was give them money and you never got the goods They were con men. Well, what's Satan? Ever since the beginning, he's been a con man. And he takes something and you're like, well, it's like the tail of a scorpion, but they got something that scorpions don't have. And there were stings, plural, in their tails, plural. Does that mean each one only had one tail and one stinger? I don't know. I just know that however many tails there are, there's a stinger in each one of them. And however many they have, they use them to inflict torment upon men for five months. Then verse number 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. You know what those words mean? I mean, destroyer. What does 2 Timothy 2 tell us that Satan is? He's the destroyer. I've heard people say that they think that Abaddon, Apollyon, is an angel of hell. There's only one angel in hell. That's the king. His name's Lucifer. He doesn't share his position with anybody. A third of the angels that fell with him, none of them's ever challenged him. Why? Because the reason they followed him is because they thought he was the bee's knees. He likes to be called the light bringer. He likes to be called right, the chief musician if you will he, he likes to be in front and center a lot like Diotrephes he loves the preeminence but for the first time that I know of since the garden he gets to strut his stuff on the earth doesn't have to take the form of a servant he gets to be himself it says they had a king over them Why do the locusts have crowns? Because they have a so-called king. A crown signifies that you've got a position in the kingdom. One day we're going to be given crowns. As rewards. Now there's a crown of life for all those who love his appearing. One example. Jesus told us we'd have gold, silver, and precious gems that pass through the judgment of God that we can lay up in the kingdom of heaven. What are we going to do with those? We're going to give them to the one that deserves it, Jesus. He says, we'll lay them down at his feet, cast them at his feet. You know what cast means? It means that it doesn't mean anything to you. 
Lord, I didn't do this to have it for me. I did it so that you could wear it. The crown was for you. My labor was so that it would bring glory and honor to you. But see, Satan, he's real big about outward appearances, remember. You know what makes a king even better? If other kings bow down and worship him. What's he do? He gives crowns to everybody that will follow him. It's just one problem. In order to get it, you got to be in the bottomless pit called hell. No, thank you. I will not take a crown, and I'll pass. But see, some people haven't made that choice. Some of them angels that came out of glory with them, they wanted one of his crowns. They got them. And for the first time in history, God took the lid off of hell. I know it's closed because I know that hell expands its borders every day. I kind of partly believe that because hell's getting so big, that's why we got so many earthquakes and natural disasters. Because in order to make more room, guess what God's got to do? He's got to stretch earth a little bit. But for the first time, he takes the roof off. And for the first time, without fear of retribution, Satan gets to send his minions out up into the smoke and then he gets to walk in and say, hey, while you're down there in torment, let me introduce myself. Verse number 12, One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. That's just fifth. We still got six and seven. There's two more to come. But look with me, if you will, at verse number 20. It says, And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders nor their sorceries nor their fornication nor their thefts. God has sent these judgments to man, allowed Satan for a time to have his way with mankind. To a degree, Satan really desires the destruction of Israel, but he can't touch them because God said that he could. So what's he do while he's waiting for the Lord to show up, meet him at the Battle of Armageddon? Well, he goes around and he tortures men for five months. Sends his minions out. And the first woe is that they're in excruciating pain. Day in and day out, they beg to die, and Satan laughs in their face and says, you missed that opportunity. You could have chose to die out to self and accept Christ, but instead, you didn't. And now you want to die and you can't. He walks around and he says, the reason you're here in torments is because you believed the lie that I originally started. And every day they cry out for somebody to put them out of their misery, but mercy doesn't come. Grace doesn't show up to answer the call. Man gets what they sowed. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. What's man been sowing for a very long time now? Hell on earth. And here in the beginning part of chapter number 9, guess what they get? Hell on earth. But we know the end of the story, even after torment for five months, even after the next trumpet, the woe comes. Guess what? It's worse. But even after all of that, they still don't repent of their wrongdoings. You know what this chapter symbolizes? That pain will never trump pride. Jonah didn't humble himself before God in the belly of that whale because he was in pain. He humbled himself because he came to himself and realized he was there because of his disobedience to God. Now go read the book of John. He thought he was in hell. Because from his point of view, he was cast into an ocean by a bunch of angry sailors, and then it was just darkness. 
And he's in a place that causes his skin pain. But maybe he heard that whale singing or the great fish making noises. I don't know what happened, but eventually he realized he wasn't. And he came to himself and repented before God. But what happened? Fish spit him out on the beach. But even then, it wasn't the pain that humbled Job. I mean, Jonah. Right? All the pain that Job went through, literally his flesh was full of boils. Right? Satan trying to break his will. He knew he was right. He knew God was right. He knew his friends were a bunch of idiots. Every time they tried to rebuke him, and he says, you foolish idiots. He even told his wife, you speak as the foolish women. Shall we not receive good things and evil from the hand of God? He says, we don't get to pick, God picks. He says, it's our job to serve him and to worship him in the meantime. Give him glory because he deserves it. Pain didn't destroy Job. Pain will not destroy these people's will. The will of man is something that either has to be broken by the hand of God when he breaks men's hearts, or through the cords of loving kindness that the Holy Ghost used to draw men unto him. You know when Pharaoh's heart was broke? When God broke it. He hardened it until it could harden no more, and then it snapped. It broke. You know when these people's wills are finally going to be broken? When God breaks their will, when he casts them into the lake of fire. They'll be defiant until the end. That they were right, that they did many great works in his name and cast out demons and did all these great things in the name of Jesus. And he'll say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Man's pride and man's will will remain intact until the end. They're going to go out kicking and screaming. Wailing about how God's wrong and they're right. You say that's foolish. Yes. But that's the power that your mind has over your body. As a man thinketh, so is he. If you think it hard enough and believe it long enough in your mind, it'll be just as true as the fact that God exists. In fact, your mind can go so far as to convince you that God doesn't exist, which is the greatest lie that you can ever believe. What are you saying? Even after all of this, these men will not repent. Yet we go through such trivial things in comparison, and yet we still remain prideful towards God. Still remain boastful. Non-repent. That makes you appreciative of the mercy and long-suffering and grace of God. Because one day He's taking it away, and that's what pain's going to be left with. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore, where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.